let's find them. That's what we're after. So at this point, we can solve lots and lots of equations. But there's still some out there that we haven't solved yet. And that would be talking about solving square root and other radical equations. You guys have solved square roots before. That, that's not a big deal. But cube root equations, fourth root, fifth root equations, it's still out there. You know, we still need to see that. And in the end, you will find there will still be some that we aren't able to solve, even when we get out of algebra 2. We're going to pick our way through a whole bunch of solving, um, but there's, there's still more out there. So what we want to do is solve square root and other radical equations. And I think this is a really good problem to look at because it's relevant to today. And that is, you can take your cell phone wherever you want. It doesn't mean you're going to have coverage. It doesn't mean that when you turn it on, you're actually going to be able to dial out. Um, if you've got a phone like me, I, if I'm over here in my room, I can't make a call out. It's like you can't make it through the brick walls, you know? Um, if you are in Minnesota, there are going to be some spots where you get dropped calls. You know, you're talking to somebody on the phone and you're driving and all of a sudden, it cut out. What did it do? But not a lot. And that's because Minnesota's population is, well, they're more spread out as other parts of the country. If you go to North Dakota or South Dakota, you can drive for 20 miles and not see a farm, not see a person. You'll see animals, but you may not see people. And so when you have cell phone towers, there are going to be spots where things are going to drop. Now, what happens is this. People call and complain. And... Uh, if they get enough complaints, the Verizon, the Sprint, the whoever, will say, we got to put a new, another cell phone tower up because these people are saying they're going to take their business elsewhere because they can't get any calls out there. And what they try to do is hide them. They'll put them on the tops of really tall buildings if the owner of the building says it's okay. Um, they'll try to find a, a church even where they'll allow them to put their cell phone uh, power up on there. But places like North Dakota, South Dakota, as you get further out into Montana, you just don't have any options. You have to put a new cell phone tower up. So you're a passenger in the car, and you're using a cell phone that connects the cell phone tower shown. The tower has an effective range of six miles. How many miles do you have to finish your call and justify your answer? Now, we're not going to go through and do the whole thing. But I need to show you here that by the cell phone tower being in the middle, what we're doing is we're creating a circle where people would have service. And so eventually the car will travel outside that circle range and the phone will just drop the call. That's what's going to happen. So if we are using this three miles as a radius, and I know that's not what the problem said, but we're going to look at that as a circle and say our current radius is three. So x squared plus y squared equals nine equation for the circle that I've drawn up there that um, has the yellow car on the circle. If I'm supposed to solve that for pairs of x and y, I'm going to have to know how to undo square root stuff. And that's square roots. So it just naturally tells you that people that are trying to figure out where the cell phone tower is, they need no math. They do. They have to figure out how are we going to get this to work. Uh, can we just make the cell phone tower higher? Will that help its range? Because maybe it's mountains or hills that are in the way that are causing the problem? Or do we physically have to go out and put a new cell phone tower down somewhere and make it happen? So that's where we're going today. When our work problems are not going to be that difficult. But it's a good start. So a radical equation, big shopper, is going to have a radical in it. It will. It's an equation that has a variable in a radicand or a variable with a rational exponent. So we've talked about how you can take radicals and make them into fraction powers. Now we need to realize, hey, that means that we can solve those in a method that should work when we're talking about radicals. So it gives us a couple of different options. Square root equation. That's where we're going to start. And yes, in Expo, you probably got a little baby glimpse at solving square root equations. So we're going to bring you back to that today. But by the time we leave today, we will also do one cube problem so that you see, hey, we are taking this a little farther than what you've done in the past. So a square root equation is an equation with a radical of index 2. In this lesson, all radicals and expressions with rational exponents will represent real numbers. We're not going to do anything with imaginary again. 
So solving a square root equation may require that you square each side of the equation. Duh! How do you get rid of square root? You square stuff. Problem. Whenever you raise something to an even power, there's a risk that you have just created a false solution. You did all the math right. You get the answer like you're supposed to, but you plug it back in and it doesn't work. And that is something that happens uniquely anytime you raise something to an even power. Not odds, just even powers. So there's a fancy name for that in math because there's always a fancy name for everything in math. Extraneous solutions. It's not exclusive to us, though. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. Every once in a while, you'll hear about somebody that um, went and had a blood test. Thanks, Shelby. And um, the blood test said they're diabetic. But the doctor said, oh, I'm not seeing a lot of those symptoms. Why don't you come in and we'll run that test again? And they run it a second time, and they're not diabetic. And that's because they may have forgotten that they ate something before they went to the doctor. And when the doctor asked them that question, they didn't remember, and they honestly thought, no, I didn't need anything, but it showed up. So there are false positives in other areas as well that needs to be tested, and that's, that's what we do. We test. We test and see it. We check to see if it works. To solve a radical equation, isolate the radical on one side of the equation, then raise each side to a power suggested by the index. Don't hit the page. Instead, grab a highlighter. This is huge. Grab a highlighter. We're going to have a couple of things today. We don't have a lot of blah, blah, blah in this section, but the things that we do are a really big deal. Here's the big deal. We have to get the radical by itself. That's what they mean by isolate the radical on one side of the equation. Radical over here, everything else over there. That's how we solve things. And that's because what we want to do is just undo the power. We can't undo all the adding and subtracting by raising something to a power. We have to undo the power by raising to a power. And that power is going to be the radical, the index of the radical. So we need to isolate the radical on one side of the equation before we do any raising things to the power. I always talk about how when we're solving equations, we're really following the order of operations backwards. That is exactly what we're doing. When you think of, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, and down there at the bottom, you have add and subtract. So the first thing we undo is any addition and subtraction. If there's anything multiplied or divided, then that's the next thing we undo. And you just work your way up. And so eventually, we'll get to the point where we're trying to get rid of the power. But you do everything else first because we have to isolate the radical. So immediately, it's problem. That's all they tell us. Isolate the radical. Because we know how to do the rest of it. That's all we need so I look at this and I say to myself, self, there's the radical. It is not by itself. There's a plus three. It's got to go. And move it over to the other side. Subtract three from both sides. And we'll have square root of 2x minus 3 equals 5. Oh, I'm going to have you stop with that stuff. So now I have that radical isolated. And now I can say to myself, that's square root. How does a person get rid of the square root? Oh, if it's just still on the desk behind me, I can So we're going to square both sides. But here's what I also know. I might have just created a false solution by squaring that. These two are inverses, they're going to drop right out and we'll get 2x minus 3 equals 25. We're going to do the math we know we're supposed to do after that point. We're going to add 3 and divide by 2. And we get x equals 14, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I had to square this. So even though I got 14 and I did all the math right, it might not work. So I have to check, have to check and make sure that it's going to work. So I take my 14 and I put it right back up there. 3 plus the square root of 2 times 14 minus 3 is that equal 8. I follow the order of operations. 2 times 14 is 28. 28 minus 3 is 25. 3 plus the square root of 25 
3 plus 5 does equal 8. Good news. It works. There it is. But we need to check. On each one of these, we're going to see there's a little spot where it says check. And just to remind us, hey, maybe, just maybe, you might do all this math and it doesn't work. So let's look at this one. What's your first step? Add five. All right, let's get it over there. You gotta isolate the radical. Then square both sides. Then what? More math. Subtract one and maybe we're done. Hey, if it works. So we need to stop and we need to check it out. It's like, is this really going to work? Let's take a peek. Square root of four times six plus one. If I subtract five from that, do I get zero? Well, that's 25. Oh, yep, yep. 5 minus 5 is 0. By the time we get done with the notes today, I'm going to say, see, those are liar. They always work. She's just making the students extra check for nothing. They always do that in the notes. They give us the nice ones where things go great, and then you get to the homework, and you say, I don't need to check these. They all worked all the time, and sure enough, one of them won't work. So if we had checked this and it didn't work, we would have to say no real solutions. Because if the answer we found by doing the math isn't the one that works, then there aren't any. So we make sure we're doing that math right by checking. Now, you got that highlighter, you're going to need her again. To solve the equations of the form, x to the m over n equals k. OK, let me back up here. x to the m over n equals k. Raise each side of the equation to the power n over m. That's the reciprocal of m over n. I think that makes sense. mn over nm. Oh, wait a minute. Even though they're in a different order, they're the same thing. That would just be x. I like that. Raise each side of the equation to the reciprocal power. To the reciprocal power. However, there's a big however here. If the numerator or the denominator of your fraction is even, our good old friend, the absolute value, shows. And I'm going to tell you the book is being conservative here. In reality, it only matters whether or not our denominator is even. Here's why. If we're going to raise something to a power that has an even number on the bottom, remember from a couple of days ago, if these are radicals, this is the square root. And whenever you take square root, you're supposed to put plus or minus. Fourth root. Whenever you take 4th root, plus or minus. Whenever you take 6th root, plus or minus. So really, the rule should state, if the denominator is even, then you should use absolute value. But what they're doing is they're being extra cautious. And they're saying, you know what? If it's the top or the bottom, just use absolute value. Check your answers. One of them might not work. You know, but just always use absolute value, and you'll be safe. So if we have the denominator as an even number, we absolutely need those absolute value bars. No question about it. We are introducing another solution. So this little bugger, look at that. That's all we get. One little blah, 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 and away we go. We still have to isolate the radical. But now it's a fraction power. So I'm looking for the fraction power, and I see, well, it's just for these parentheses here. That three, got to go. It's out of here. And 
remember what we had to highlight on the last page. And that is to undo that fraction power, we raise it to the reciprocal power. So the entire side of the equation gets raised to that three halves power. And here is where we say my denominator is even. I am going to need some absolute value bars here. On the right hand side, we're going to do a little math. We're going to say, okay, three halves. That's really the square root of four. Cubed. Well, that's two. And two cubed is eight. And that all comes from the fact that this is really the square root over here. And when you take the square root, you should get a plus and a minus. So that's the reason with absolute value that we're going to write x plus 1 equals negative 8 and x plus 1 equals positive 8. Because it could be either one. Now some of you might be saying, could I have to do that without absolute value bars? Could I do that? Could I look at this and say, oh, the square root of 4, that's going to be plus or minus 2. Plus or minus 2 cubed is plus or minus 8 and just set them up immediately. Yes. If you want to do it that way, do it that way. If you don't want to mess with the absolute value bars, totally fine with that. But remember, it needs to be something that's going to hang on in your memory. So ask yourself, am I going to remember to always put that plus or minus piece over there? And if the absolute value helps you do that, then that's what you do. Because we're saying the distance from this to 0 is 8. And on a number line, that would be negative 8 and positive 8. So we have to make sure we get them both. And then these are just little one-steppers from here. This is x equals negative 9 and x equals 7. One might work. Both might work. Neither one might work. We better check. So 3 times negative 9 plus 1 to the 2 thirds equals 12. Negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8. All right, so negative 8 to the 2 thirds. That's the cubed root of negative 8, which is negative 2. And when I square it, I'm going to get 4. Oh, cool. It works. This one's good. Doesn't mean the other one's wrong. It just means this one was right. So now we check the other one. And that will be 3 times 7 plus 1 to the 2 thirds. And you get to this point and you go, see your own can't we just put the check? Because we see it's going to be 8. So the same thing, yeah. We've got it. 8 to the 2 thirds is going to give us cubed root of 8, which is 2. 2 squared is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. Two solutions for this one. And they both work. So, checking. Getting used to that habit. Oh my goodness. That's a train wreck waiting to happen there. All right, what would you do first? Subtract the 1, exactly. 3, fifth roots of x plus 1 cubed equals 24. Next step. Get rid of the 3, divide by it. Fifth root of x plus 1 cubed equals 8. Whew. Now it's decision time. And that decision is, do we want to raise both sides to the fifth power? Think about that for a second. Do we want to raise 8 to the fifth power and then take the cubed root? Or would we change this to a fraction power and hope for better math that we can do it or not? I would say we better hope for fraction power or giving us better numbers here. So we're going to change this fifth root of x plus 1 to the third to x plus 1 to the something. What's the something? Yeah, index is always the denominator. And we're going to hope that gives us some math we can do in our noggin over there with the 8. Because we're going to raise this to what power? Oh, that's a good thing. Do I need absolute value bars? Nope, both of those are odd. So we're going to get x plus 1 equals, ooh, math we can do in our head. Cubed root of 8 is 2. 2 to the 5th is? Yeah, not as fast, and that's okay, because most of us memorize 2 cubed is 8, 2 to the 4th is 16, 2 to the 5th is 32. Subtract 1. 
Ta da! Beautiful answer. Maybe. Maybe. Let's see. We put 31 in here. This is going to work. Three fifth roots of 31 plus 1 cubed plus 1 equals 25. Woo! Fifth root of 32 cubed plus 1. Thirty-two cube. Fit through that. Where do one of these things here? Let's see. Thirty-two cubed. Two to the third, and then I want fit through to that. So five math number five of thirty-two thousand seven hundred sixty-eight. Hey, it's eight. Three times eight plus one equals twenty-five. Well, sure it does. No, you're thinking Cedar Home Hawaii, or we never have checked these answers. Remember, they're giving us some nice ones. Oh, well, that one doesn't look so bad. It's like kind of a safe little problem. Let's check and see. Um, we have 2 times x plus 3 to the 2 thirds equals 8. Hmm, step 1. Divide by 2. Got to isolate that radical. Raise it to what power? Three halves. At this point, you should be saying, wait a minute, isn't there something I'm supposed to do with that? Yeah, absolute value bars. So what's four to the three halves? Eight. Square root of four is two, but remember that would be a plus or minus two. That's why we have to have those absolute value bars in there. So now we have x plus 3 equals negative 8, and x plus 3 equals positive 8. Those are two little one-step equations. I like those. Negative 11 and 5. I'm going to see if they work. Let's see. 2 times negative 11 plus 3 to the 2 thirds equals 8. All right. Negative 11, that's negative 8. The two thirds equals eight. Okay, so cubed root of negative eight would be negative two. But when I square it, I'm going to get four. Oh yeah, that one's good. Negative eleven works. Two times five plus three to the two thirds equals eight. And of course, it's going to work. This is the eight. You know. Boom. They work. Two solutions thanks to little Mr. Absolute Value Bars. Oh, no word problem. Good news. When it occurs in the middle of a section, it means it's not too hard. It's the ones at the end after you've done all the hard math that are the brain teasers. So let's see here. Meteor Crater. That's a really creative name. Meteor Crater in Arizona, the formula D equals 2 cubed roots of V over 0 0.3 relates the diameter D of the rim in meters. Ooh, that sounds like that's important. In meters to the volume V in cubic meters. What is the volume of Meteor Crater? I don't know. We have to know how far across it is. Oh, that's in the picture. It is and it isn't. 1.2 kilometers. We're not supposed to use kilometers, are we? So how many meters are in a kilometer? A thousand. So that's going to be 1,200 kilometers. Now i got to figure out where that's supposed to go in the formula. Oh, thank you, label drop. There you go. You suppose that's D or V? It is D. It's a diameter. Well, let's put that 1,200 in there and do a little solving. 1,200 equals 2 cube roots of V over 0 0.3. Oh, 
called yourself at? Divide by two. Then what? Cube them. Now I'm not grabbing a calculator right now because I want this to be an exact answer. So I'm just going to keep writing it as 600 to the third until I have something to punch in. So how do we get B alone? Multiply by 0 0.3. So now this is punch inable. 0 0.3 times 600 to the third equals B. Woo! 600 to the third. I think he wants all those zeros in there, Noggin. So, 0.3 times 600 to the third power. Oh my goodness. Sixty four million eight hundred thousand what? Just meters? Cubic meters. We were talking about volume. <clears throat> One for you. Look at that. You're so lucky. Suppose the <coughs> diameter of a similarly shaped crater is one kilometer. What is the volume of the crater? I'm sure that'll take you all about 10 seconds. No, you just made a big circle around something. Are you done? Uh, I have it in the Oh, you have it in scientific. Does your calculator automatically do scientific notation? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's kind of cool. Anybody with a normal zero, lots of zeros calculator? Nobody has a calculator. All right, well, then let's everybody take your shoes off. We'll use our fingers and toes. Somebody tell me what they got for this volume. Thirty-seven million five hundred. Thank you very much, by the way. Thirty-seven million five hundred thousand watts. Cubic meters. So what we're supposed to do today. We're supposed to figure out how to solve. And you know what? We just did one with a three for an index. Wow! Four, three, two, one, zero. Me. I feel much solvent. Those are pretty good numbers. That absolute value part usually gets another dominant look. When are we going to use absolute value, everybody? Even root denominator. Yeah, even root down there. All right. That sticks. Well, let's do a few of those. Obviously, there's work to be shown. You know, don't hand in a bunch of answers or you're going to get back and it's going to say show work or no credit. Can I give you the odds? It's because I want you to be able to check your answers in the back of the book. Not because I want you to copy them. But you're doing great. So far, so good. I'm going to have to stop because you were up to um, the sections that I'm going to currently teach. So I want to just keep those in my binder as it is. You were just too fast. What did you do for your fundraiser?